Why is Girls' Generation regarded as a legendary girl group in K-pop? Finally, Girls' Generation is back with Forever One after five long years. The K-pop industry has evolved and grown in their time away, but the impact of the original nation's girl group is as present as ever. If you're a so-on back from the depths of the Tumblr abyss, or maybe you're newer to Sonia Shide and want to know a little bit more about them, either way, stick around because today we're celebrating the life and career of Girls' Generation and its members in honor of their highly anticipated anticipated return to K-pop's main stage. Let's blast off and get started. JM in your universe. 안녕하세요, friends. I'm Jonathan Miller, and welcome back to Jonathan Miller Music, where we help each other become better artists. It's no secret that Girls' Generation is my old group in K-pop. They got me through a lot in life, and I've always wanted to do something special once they finally returned. Well, it only took five years, and my bones sure are rickety from the literal apocalypse we've all been through since holiday night, but we're here now. Nature is healing. So, this is the legendary Girls' Generation. 지금은 Sonia Shide. The second generation of K-pop acts began in the new millennium. Boa was becoming the first Korean act to break through in Japan and starting the trend of K-pop acts releasing music in Japanese. Shinwa was earning the hearts of young fans and dominating the game that Super Junior and TVXQ were soon to follow. The internet was a brand new toy in the hands of adolescent millennials and radio still decided who was popular in music. No Spotify, no TikTok, no YouTube until just a little later. Already successful groups around the world were fading in popularity, especially girl groups like SES and boys ruled the radio. Luckily, founder of SM Entertainment, the home to these aforementioned groups, Isu Man, had an idea that would help fill this void. K-pop utilizes a training system for finding idols that has become almost infamous over the years. At this time, it was common for the method to be who you know for getting discovered or getting auditions. While vacationing with her family in South Korea, Jessica Jung and her sister Crystal were scouted by an SM talent scout in the mall and were invited to audition for SM Entertainment, which luckily both of them ended up passing their auditions. That might seem really creepy or weird by today's standards, but back then, it was a fairly common way for people to be scouted into the entertainment industry around the world and to find potential new acts. And if you think that's weird, Sohyun was scouted on the subway before auditioning. Another way K-pop idols were discovered by agencies were through notable talent shows. You didn't necessarily have to win, but you better hope that the scout still thought you were talented. This is how Yuri, who won second at SM Youth Best Dancer competition, and Taeyeon, who won first at SM Youth Best Singing competition, joined SM Entertainment. Being more of a talent agency than a typical record label as we're more familiar with in the West, although they are quite similar. Another option for finding talent to train is a good old open audition or cast call, which fortunately a lot of K-pop entertainment companies hold regularly. Young, who already held prior experience in a J-pop group, Route Zero, that only lasted one year, Hyoyeon, Yuna, and Tiffany all entered SM Entertainment this way. One girl, Lee Soon Kyu, or Sunny as we would come to know her as, had already been an SM Entertainment trainee since 1998, and after five years, moved to another company, Star World, in order to debut in a special duo. Unfortunately, the group never debuted, and Lee Ayumi, aka Iconic, a well-known Korean and Japanese singer and friend, convinced Sunny to rejoin SM Entertainment just in the nick of time. 2007 was here, and it was time for Girls' Generation. But first, a word from this video sponsor, DistroKid. DistroKid is one of the leading music distributors in the game, helping independent artists like you and me get our music up on places like Apple Music, Spotify, Tidal, and more. For one yearly fee, you can distribute as much music as you want and keep 100% of your earnings. They also offer a wide array of features that help you promote your music as well, including making your Spotify releases pop with Spotify canvases. Spotify canvases are small looping videos that play in the background when someone streams your song instead of a static album art image. If you've got a music video for a song, that's going to be an excellent choice for you for this. Spotify canvases are available for all DistroKid members too. Simply open up the Spotify for Artists mobile app, click the library button at the bottom, pick a song, and then hit create canvas. You'll be able to choose a three to eight second video from your photos app to upload, and then it will be available for your fans to see. This is a great tool for branding and helps bring your track to life. Use my special VIP link to save yourself 7% on your first year's membership with DistroKid. Link is in the description. 
The group practiced their choreography for their debut song, Into the New World, for well over a year. The song, written by K-pop songwriting legend Kenzie, had already been shopped around for a number of years before it was deemed best for Girls' Generation. Taeyeon, as the group's oldest member, was selected as the leader of this new nine-member girl group. Then, on August 5th, 2007, Girls' Generation officially debuted on SBS's Inki Kayo. Very little stage makeup, minimal theatricality. The goal was to have audiences focus on their vocals and choreography, while simultaneously ushering in a new era for girl groups in K-pop. Their self-titled debut album, Girls' Generation, hit stores in November of the same year, preceded by a cover of Lee Sung Cho's 1989 classic, Girls' Generation, from which the girls get their group name, and Kissing You, the album only achieved moderate success. You see, being a girl group that the public wasn't as connected with yet, Girls' Generation in their debut era faced the cold, unforgiving touch of anti-fans in Korea very quickly. An annual event held at the Seoul World Cup Stadium called the Dream Concert in 2008 saw one of the darkest days in K-pop and a nightmare for SNSD, the Black Ocean. If you're unfamiliar, K-pop groups have signature light sticks that coincide with their favorite groups and have interactive light-up features that fans can use at concerts to actively participate in them with idols. This particular event held popular groups like TVXQ, Super Junior, Wonder Girls, and fans excitedly cheered for them until rookie group Girls' Generation took the stage. The entire audience turned off their lights and fell silent, creating one of the most embarrassing moments for the girls and embarrassing moments in K-pop. It's something no one wants to happen, and many reasons floated around for a long while as to why it even happened in the first place. Regardless, it's one reason idols are very careful now about what they say or do, as no one wants to repeat that dreaded 10-minute set of tears from the girls and silence from the fans. It might sound a little melodramatic now, but it's very serious. Girls' Generation took an immediate hiatus following the Black Ocean, and then came back with one of the most popular songs in Korean history. G took the internet and South Korea by storm at a time when viral videos were just starting to be a thing. The EP sold over 100,000 copies in South Korea alone and became the longest running number one song on Music Bank at nine consecutive weeks and held the record for three years. Its music video sparked a gigantic dance trend, flash mobs, and parodies, and its infectious hook has become infamous. It was the best-selling single of 2009, and its success can actually be tracked to show when Google searches for K-pop began to rise on the internet. While it might be easy to label Girls' Generation as a one-hit wonder, they soon proved they weren't playing around in skinny jeans. Genie dropped a little over a year after the dreaded Black Ocean, and it was like it had never even happened. Originally an English-language song called I Just Wanna Dance by Natalie Makoma, during this time, it was fairly common for English songs to be translated and transformed into Korean hits. It's a process in which songwriters shop their compositions around to various other artists through their managers, usually called getting songs placed, with acts looking for music to record for their albums. Before the internet, the Asian music market and the Western music market didn't often overlap. So no one really thought much anything of it. I mean, the chances of people realizing a famous K-pop song was originally recorded or released in the West, or even just demoed by a Western artist, was very, very low, so it wasn't really much of a big deal. And it also really wasn't some giant secret that people were trying to keep hidden either. In fact, the practice still continues today. Long story short, when a song is picked up by an A&R rep, the agency, in this case SM Entertainment, typically places a hold on the song saying, yes, we want to record it, don't give it to anyone else for a period of time. Sometimes that period can be a couple of months or a couple of years or more. Then if the song is officially selected, songwriters will then give the rights to record the song and allow lyric translations, some recontextualization aspects, and some moderate reworkings to the song in exchange for a songwriter's bread and butter royalties. This is essentially how we got from I Just Wanna Dance to Genie. Genie helped solidify Girls' Generation's success, selling 50,000 copies in its first week, nearly doubling the first week sales of G. This was not very common for girl groups at the time. What really helped Girls' Generation become a household name was their helipad live performance on Music Core watched by 8.6 million viewers, becoming the top rated and most watched performance in Korean history. But the girls didn't stop there. Girls' Generation entered the 2010s with their second album, O, oh, and its repackaged version, Run Double Run in which both of the music videos for their title tracks are connected and show different sides to the women. They became the second and fourth best-selling albums of 2010 respectively in South Korea. Then, 
Following in the footsteps of label mates TVXQ and BOA, Girls' Generation signed with Nayuta Wave Records and dropped Japanese versions of Genie and G to break into the Japanese music market. It's the world's second largest music market and potentially one of the most profitable if you can break through successfully. The Japanese version of G became the first single by a non-Japanese girl group to reach the top three of the Oricon charts and eventually became a million seller. During this time, they surprised Korean fans by dropping their EP Hoot and then continued to dominate the Japanese market, selling a million copies of their debut Japanese album and embarking on their first Japan arena tour. After winning Album of the Year at the 2012 MTV VMAs Japan, they became known as the most popular and well-known K-pop group in Japan, alongside Kara, who was also doing very well there too. By conquering the second biggest music market in the world and their own country's market, it was time to go for the number one biggest market the U.S. If you've seen my deep dive on Taeon as a soloist, you'll know the U.S. market is very unforgiving and not very welcoming to foreign musical acts, especially foreign acts of color. Still, SNSD managed to become the very first K-pop act to perform on American late night TV, something that is now almost commonplace. They were hopeful because during this time, K-pop was just starting to become more well-known as the Hallyu wave began crashing onto American shores. They performed at SM Town Live in Madison Square Garden, and if you were an avid reader of music blogs at the time or on Tumblr, there's a high chance you knew who Girls' Generation was. Even though it didn't go out as they hoped, the girls returned to Japan and dropped paparazzi, and quickly continued their reign in Japan, and the first official subunit for the group Teiti So debuted in Korea, just before Sai dropped Gangnam Style and made K-pop a completely viral sensation. 2013 is the first year K-pop became a known thing worldwide. Maybe not like it is now, but it was the true beginning and SNSD took a chance by making their Korean comeback with I Got A Boy. YouTube was now popular, the internet was making viral sensations, Tumblr edits were thriving, Vine was around, I Got A Boy, known for its very experimental song structure, street style choreography, and bright colors, set the tone for the beginning of K-pop's third generation, in which these aspects would become standard. Unfortunately, resistance still occurred, and not everyone was ready to embrace K-pop. I Got A Boy beat out acts like Justin Bieber and Psy at the inaugural YouTube Music Awards, and not every article was kind toward this foreign act whom was not a household name outside of Asia. It was change, and people don't always like change. Sadly, this wouldn't be the only thing that changed Girls' Generation. With success often comes trouble, differences, trials, even scares. For example, during a performance of Run Devil Run at the Latte World Ice Rink, a man attempted to kidnap Taeyeon while performing on stage. In 2015, Yuna was stalked by a Sasang fan who stole her staff's security card and acted as a security guard for Yuna, violating her safety. Sasang fans are similar to what are known as anti-fans in K-pop in how they are both obsessive and invasive of Korean celebrities' lives. However, Sasang fans, which come from the Korean words sa, meaning private, and sang, meaning life, differ from anti-fans by usually being motivated by a desire to be recognized by their favorite idol. Whereas anti-fans are cruel and will purposefully endanger the lives of idols or attempt to spread malicious rumors. Sunny was also once followed by a Sasang fan while driving to visit her parents in 2014, even taking to Twitter to write a warning message about being worried what the Sasang fan's reckless driving could do to others. Speaking of injuries, SNSD experienced quite a few, including Yuri, who was in so much pain from wearing heels and performing all the time in 2017. She tore a ligament and had to have a piece of bone removed in surgery. She also had to receive many shots in order to overcome the pain she was in. What arguably changed Girls' Generation the most was Jessica's high-profile departure in 2014. Seemingly pushed out of the group ahead of their Japanese comeback, Catch Me If You Can, in which the song and its music video had already been filmed, Jessica immediately exited Girls' Generation when they were at the top of their game. Many details are still relatively unknown, although in Jessica's recent novel, Bright, the sequel to her book, Shine, about a Korean-American girl who chased her dream of being a K-pop star did cause many fans to believe that the book is actually an allegory for what happened to Jessica. What we do know for certain is that a meeting took place between the remaining members of Girls' Generation, Jessica and Lee Soo Man, the CEO of SM Entertainment, allegedly due to conflicts between Jessica's then recently launched fashion brand Blanc and Eclair and the tight schedule for Girls' Generation's upcoming activities. A vote was cast to remove Jessica from the group. 
terminating her contract with SM Entertainment early. Jessica's final single as a member of Girls' Generation is Divine from their Japanese greatest hits album, The Best. While speculation continues, it's important to remember that K-pop contracts are ironclad documents. Idols are required to follow them or face extreme legal consequence. That includes if contracts are broken early. Press releases are handled much differently in Korea than they are in America, for example, because our celebrity cultures are different. In the US, could you eventually get a tell-all autobiography from your favorite celebrity and finally find out what happened to them? Sure, in time, maybe. In South Korea, however, usually the answer is no, and that's a full sentence. Meaning, the members of Girls' Generation will most likely never be allowed to mention Jessica or even be seen with her, not out of direct resentment, but because they may legally not be able to. If there is still resentment or any issues like that, that's between them. It's well known that following Jessica's removal, she was immediately blacklisted from South Korean entertainment shows, which is why you'll probably never see her on something like M Countdown, for example, nor see her in clips of Girls' Generation songs or media used in video montages on variety shows or things like that. Although there have been a few instances where she has appeared because seven years in close Close proximity with eight other people is a little hard to edit out, but those shows are also probably legally unable to show Jessica as well. And it is important to remember that. Another thing to consider is the potential fans or anti-fans reactions that may occur. If Jessica is shown like normal, people will be upset that an inactive member of Girls' Generation is still being given the spotlight. If she's not shown, fans will be angered and dub it Jessica Erasure. The easiest thing is to just let both parties exist in their new dynamics and move on. Jessica thriving and doing her own thing as a solo artist and SNSD continuing as SNSD. Of course, you can also write a fictional novel, change everybody's names, locations, and select events that may or may not hold any basis in real life to eventually get your truth out that way and avoid any legal issues, but to each their own. 2015 saw the release of Lionheart, SNSD's first full album as an eight-member group, which was widely successful with hits like Party, Lionheart, and You Think. It also saw the Fantasia tour begin and the first official solo debut from the group with Taeyeon's mini-album, I, which eventually helped Taeyeon take home Best Female Artist at the Mnet Asian Music Awards. Following their group leader's success, Hyoyeon, Tiffany, and Sohyun quickly followed suit with their own solo projects. Sohyun took over full creative control with her mini-album Don't Say No, which debuted atop South Korea's Circle album chart, known then as the Gaon chart. Tiffany's I Just Wanna Dance drew upon her American heritage containing elements of R&B and synth pop, even writing her own song What Do I Do, which Soo Young actually wrote the Korean lyrics for. Jessica also made her own solo debut that year, releasing English and Korean versions of her EP With Love J. Her debut single Fly was co-written by Jessica and sold over 250,000 digital copies. She also made another comeback that year with Wonderland writing the Korean and English lyrics to four out of six songs on the mini album. Yuna, who by this time had already acted in numerous Korean dramas and won tons of accolades for them, started to gain a larger fan base in China. She released a special mini album Blossom which contained renditions of popular Mandarin songs. She also began taking more action TV and movie roles like Anna in The K2 which further increased her popularity. All of the girls stayed active and eventually came back with their album Holiday Night in 2017 to celebrate their 10th anniversary. Debuting atop Billboard's World Albums chart, Billboard also named Girls' Generation the number one K-pop girl group from the past decade. 10 years meant contract renewal time, and it was announced that Sohyun, Soo-young, and Tiffany had chosen to leave SM Entertainment. All eight members assured fans that the group was not broken up, but would be taking some time to pursue individual activities. This was very unusual, as when groups typically leave their parent agency or split up like this, it eventually leads to a full breakup. However, all of the girls repeatedly said that Girls' Generation had not broken up, even though their next full group comeback was unknown and would now involve contract negotiations with four different agencies and eight separate schedules to align. So with that, all of the members fully immersed themselves in what they wanted to do. The remaining members at SM, Taeyeon, Hyoyeon, Sunny, Yuri, and Yuna, became the subunit OGG, a name Hyoyeon picked as a play on their hits O and G, as well as Girls' 
Generation's abbreviation of GG. Yuri then released her own solo mini album, The First Scene, which went number one on iTunes in 14 different countries. Already an accomplished actress as well, she continued acting in various projects and even started her own cooking show. Sunny has been a popular MC on multiple Korean variety shows, earning the title Variety Show Queen. Known for not only her charms and wit, but also her skill as a judge or host, Sunny has also participated in various soundtracks as well. Sohyun, Soo-young, and Yuna continued acting and starred in multiple hit dramas and films. Soo-young released her first solo song, Winter Breath, and Yuna dropped her debut EP, A Walk to Remember, which became the third best-selling album by a female soloist in 2019. Yuna's status as a top South Korean figure has earned her over 11 national titles like The Nation's Center, Nation's Ideal Type, and The Nation's Visual, for being a strong embodiment of South Korean beauty standards. Sohyun starred in multiple dramas and even debuted as a lead actress in the Netflix original film, Love and Leashes. Tiffany returned to the USA and began a successful solo career dropping her EP, Lips on Lips. She eventually won Best Solo Breakout at the 2019 iHeartRadio Music Awards and also dropped her digital single, Magnetic Moon. She went out on tour and frequently performed her own solo music and occasionally Girls' Generation songs. Tiffany was also cast in the Korean Broadway production adaptation of Chicago as the main character, Roxy Hart. Jessica's brand, Blanc & Eclair, became a popular fashion company selling products in Seoul, Beijing, New York, Hong Kong, Bangkok, Shanghai, Tokyo, and Vancouver. She became a New York Times bestselling author with her book series and eventually joined season three of Sisters Who Make Waves, a Chinese reality show in which female stars over 30 compete to re-debut in a new girl group. Jessica was able to showcase more of her leadership abilities and she quickly became a fan favorite. Taeyeon and Hyoyeon had explosive solo careers with Taeyeon dropping multiple hits in Korea and Japan and Hyoyeon became a popular DJ and electronic producer. Taeyeon became the first female soloist to have five different albums sell over 100,000 units on the Circle chart. Her hit album INVU topped the Circle digital chart for over a month to name just a few things that she's done. Hyoyeon released multiple successful singles like Dessert and Second, the latter of which reached number 17 on the Billboard world digital song sales chart. She also dropped her long-awaited first mini-album, Deep, as well. Together, Taeyeon and Hyoyeon joined SM Supergroup Got the Beat for a special release as well. During this time apart, K-pop's third generation blossomed the genre and industry into a global phenomenon. BTS and Blackpink became household names around the world. Spotify and streaming became the main source of music consumption and discovery. We had a whole pandemic. The whole world of music became a completely different place unrecognizable to the world of music that Girls' Generation left in 2017. SNSD's absence has been strange for a number of reasons, but every year, all eight members continuously found a way to celebrate their anniversaries come together and support one another despite their different schedules and despite their different agencies. The members repeatedly promised fans that Girls' Generation was forever with the hashtag GGForever, even when articles or interviewers would try to imply that the group was in fact over. Girls' Generation's hiatus and separation would make a comeback of that type unprecedented in K-pop. It's unheard of. But luckily, as we recently discovered, it's a promise they kept. Girls' Generation and its members have done a lot of good things since debuting in 2007. They were one of K-pop's earliest openly supportive groups of the LGBTQ plus community, even including drag queens in their music video for All Night and Love and Girls, the latter of which Taeyeon defended their inclusion when the music video was initially criticized. Tiffany has shared multiple letters to the LGBTQ plus community and has stated how much she loves that the community has embraced their hit into the new world. Sohyun traveled to North Korea during the important historic and diplomatic peace talks for the Spring is Coming concert in Pyongyang to host the event. She also has made numerous donations to charities like the Sungil Hope Foundation to build a hospital for ALS patients. Yuna has made donations helping impoverished families with over 300 million won to the community chest of Korea, which for many years she did privately before hoping to inspire others to do the same. Young's father suffers from retinitis pigmentosa and every year since 2015, she hosts a charity auction and concert to raise money 
money to help those who are also suffering from it. Taeyeon has donated 100 million won to the Korean Red Cross to help provide disadvantaged women get hygiene products. Tiffany came out in support of Black Lives Matter during the George Floyd protests of 2020, saying how important it was to continue supporting and donating to charities, fighting for racial equality even after the protests were over. Girls' Generation is widely regarded as a prominent figure in the Hollywood wave because what they did meant something, and we continue to see the positive benefits from that every day. Sonia Shide reached legendary status as a group because the individual was just as strong as the collective unit, not because a bunch of millennials want to unconsciously defend their favorite group, although of course there will always be those that do, but they've reached this status for a reason. They shifted public focus back toward women in the 2000s when men dominated music. K-pop girl groups have access to the Japanese market largely because SNSD opened the door. They hold the original viral video for K-pop with G, and because of its success during a time when the concept of a viral video was brand new, even posting music videos on YouTube became a viable promotional tool for the industry. They eventually became the first girl group to achieve five music videos amassing over 100 million views. I Got A Boy set a songwriting precedent in K-pop that has since become standard. A fusion of EDM, hip-hop, bright colors, and vocals that oftentimes favors an experimental risk. Pitchfork once called Girls' Generation's G the magnum opus of K-pop. Billboard included them in their 100 Greatest Girl Group Songs list. They're endorsed by multiple brands and are still one of the most sought-after groups for advertisers. Subunit Tay So was the first K-pop act ever to hit number one on the Billboard World Albums chart. Half of the top 10 highest-grossing girl group tours belong to Girls' Generation, and they've left an inspirational mark on hearts around the globe through their music and what they stand for. If it hadn't been for Girls' Generation, my entire music career would be different. My life would be different. They opened my eyes to new songwriting techniques, inspired me to drop music both in English and Japanese, and provided escapism from the worst decade of my life. I make music the way in which I do because of Girls' Generation. I understand the K-pop industry as well as I do, both as a musician and as a fan, because of Girls' Generation. I still study Korean and Japanese Japanese daily and took classes in them because of Girls' Generation. The most special thing about that is, I'm not alone in the way SNSD touched my life and completely changed its trajectory. When Girls' Generation took a hiatus, it symbolized getting older and fans patiently watched the gears of time shift to new groups, new fans, and a new world. They said they'd be back one day, but seeing as it hadn't really been done before, no one knew what the future would hold. But they held up their end of the bargain and finally announced a full-length return with all eight members, full promotional activities, and live performances with their seventh album, Forever One. Once again, Girls' Generation sets a new standard for what's possible in K-pop, acting as both its own governing entity, in which the members control what happens and get to be more involved creatively, while still functioning as an active group under the very company that made them all a family. What the future holds is always uncertain, but one thing is for sure. Girls' Generation accomplished the very thing they set out to do, inspire people through empowerment, escape and hope. Everything they do from here on out is just a bonus, whether that's acting, music, fashion, or more personal things like get married, have a kid or two, or come back again for another round of group excitement. They introduced a generation of kids to the world, and they continue to guide us through the shifting gears of time despite how different the world looks now. It's easy to look at stream and video view numbers and deduce that Girls' Generation wasn't as popular as groups of today, but that's not the case they were. The tools we're just so accustomed to measuring success with nowadays didn't exist back then, which wasn't even that long ago. Numbers can't accurately display Girls' Generation's popularity because they leave out so much. Never forget that SNSD brought us into the new world, helped us get settled, and then let us figure out the rest on our own. That's why they're so special. That's why they're legendary. And that is why we are all forever one with Girls' Generation.